And then we have uh, death. Now, death is an amazing thing. Uh, if you're familiar with Heidegger's philosophy, he built an entire philosophy around the phenomenon of death. And death is ultimately, you, you know, if you don't want to think about where you're, you came from, everybody at some point has to think about where they're going. And uh, I had a professor once, uh, in fact, in, in Western schools, he was really the only really great teacher that, that uh, I had. Um, Catholic, but very brilliant yeah. scholar, uh, Ken Kramer, who in a class I had with him, which some of this material is taken from, uh, about death and dying in religious traditions. And he said uh, one day in class, there is a point in your life where you will become absolutely certain of your mortality. And he said it comes to people at different stages in their life. Some people it happens really early and other people it happens really late. And when he said that to me, it struck a chord in me because I, the, I know that point with absolute certainty when that happened to me. I was 17 and I was in a really intense car accident. And I realized during the accident that I might be going into the next world, but, and I realized it, I mean completely, a total realization of mortality. And that completely altered my experience of life after that. Um, complete, I, had, I, I was disconnected for about a year uh, after that accident, completely disconnected. Conversations, I couldn't hear people talking and things. I mean, it was very, very profound experience for me. And that was my experience. For him, he said it happened when he was 25. Uh, he was in theological seminary, sitting out on a window pane, looking out, uh, and he realized he was going to die. That realization uh, of death and mortality, I think for most people, and there's also, I believe, in my own experience, there is a, uh, because it's happened several times since then, there is an experience that, that you can, you know, there, there's a belief that you cannot experience de death in, in this life. There, there is a belief um, amongst a lot of the Freudians and, and, uh, and other uh, psychologists in this culture. Uh, that you know, human beings cannot really uh, understand death as long as they're alive. In all the traditional cultures, death, spiritual death is real. That you can die to the sensory in this world before you leave this world. And in fact, that is the goal of most religious traditions, the, the spiritual death. And the spiritual death is where one enters into meaning. You die to the sensory and this is an inward experience. And once that death occurs, you can never look at the sensory world in the same light. You're freed from it, the chains of it, in a deep way. One of them said, فَفَارَقَ الْحِسَّةِ الَّذِي كَانَ عَائِقَ وَعَانَقَ this poet said, he freed himself from sensory, sensoria, that was his obstacle, and he embraced meaning, an embrace that he's not permitted to ever leave. So the idea is once you make this, you embrace this meaning, which is your mortality, and that you will be brought back into the divine present, that will completely alter your life. You will never be able to look at the world in the same way. And this is the spiritual goal of, of the spiritual path. Now, there's a lot of reasons uh, why we fear, uh, why we fear uh, dying, right? And these these five are going to be, the majority of people are going to fall into this. 
People have a fear of pain. There is a hadith in which the Prophet said, whoever loves to meet God, God loves to meet them. And his wife said, what about fearing death? And he said, we all fear death. In other words, it's very human to fear the pain right, that comes with death. What's called in the Quran, Sakratul Mawt. Uh, the Quran says, قَدْ جَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ The pangs of death have come in truth. And then it, it, it says, this is that which you were putting off. Right? We don't like to think about this. The fear of loss, separation, leaving this world, loved ones. The fear of meaninglessness. Right? Despair that comes with feeling that your life really didn't turn out the way you wanted, that it wasn't really, uh, you didn't get what you wanted to get done. Right? I can't die now, I've still got things to do. Fear of the unknown, right? Of what's going to happen in the next realm. Many people will say, well, I don't, there's nothing. But it's Pascal's wager which is, 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 is in the Muslim tradition called Sayyidina Ali's wager because he preceded Pascal by centuries with that. Somebody was debating with him about uh, you know, belief in the afterlife. He said, well, if, if, if I'm right, you're in big trouble. But if you're right, I don't have a problem, right? In other words, in the next world, if the materialist who says it all ends with death, if it indeed does, then the religious man has, has, or woman has led an ethical life. Uh, I think it was Whitehead who said, even if there isn't a day of judgment, we should all live our lives as if there was, which is the secular humanist perspective. Right? It's, we've still done the right thing. Whereas the, the, uh, the aesthetic, uh, or the garment, or the, the, the person who wants to live the sensual life uh, and not think about what's coming after, or say nothing's coming after, if indeed there is something after, then he's, he or she is in, in trouble. And then fear of non-being, right? It's hard to imagine ourselves, in fact, uh, it's, it's really at one level impossible to imagine ourselves just not here at all. Now, if you look at death, um, there's different types of death. We have physical death, but we also have psychological death. What one of the things George Vitholkas, a homeopath, said was in America, uh, we die at 25, but live to 75. Right? That, that at, at a certain point, a lot of people literally stop experiencing life and go into this just numbed state uh, where, 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 where they've had a psychological death. A physical death is determined by Harvard's... Right? I used to always be amazed in the hospital when I... because I, I saw a lot of people die. Nurses can't say they're dead. <laughs> you need the doctor to come in and declare them dead. I mean, if that's not religion, I don't know what is. <laughs> you know? The priest has to come in, right? Yeah, he's dead. Okay, thank you. Um, brain waves, that, that determines death, right? That is one type of death, brain death. So if they're not seeing brain activity, they're determined to be dead. Heart and blood, if the heart stops and blood starts circulate, stop circulating, death occurs very quickly. All right, there can be resuscitation if, if somebody is, uh, for instance, defibrillated or something, uh, brought back into uh, you know, a beating heart. But that, that happens pretty quick. The nervous system is one way of determining. So you poke, you don't get any reactions. And then breath and lungs. Uh, you really have to have all four in order for them to, you know, this is a dead, there, there's no longer life. Now, at one point people started weighing cadavers because there was a belief, you know, that the soul leaves and obviously it's going to be lighter, which again is such a stupid concept because 
it, the soul is immaterial, right? So obviously it, it's not going to have any weight. <laughs> I mean, that's the point of the soul. It's, it's not material substance. It's not part of this, this realm. It's from another realm. The body is material. Now the soul, you know, there's a lot of people that don't believe in the soul. In fact, there's a lot of scientists with, that would really like to prove that we are nothing other than anabolic and catabolic uh, processes. Just biochemistry. That's what we're dealing with. Now, at the psychological level, you have uh, types of death. So at the brain level, you get cognitive impotence, where the brain is not functioning anymore. So psychologically, you know, people literally stop thinking and they become automatons that, that literally kind of go through life uh, without really ever thinking about anything other than the most functional uh, things, you know. So people go into these trance-like states and, uh, and they go into this, this perfunctory life that is nothing other than routines, right? And this is why, like Ezra Pound, you're all teachers, Ezra Pound said, the day that a teacher is not excited about teaching a class is the day they should retire, right? So this is a, really a type of, uh, of death, of brain death, when, when you're no longer excited about the material. I was telling uh, Hakeem, I rented a car and this man said to me, I, he was from uh, another state, and I said, how long have you been here? He said, 30 years, but I'm moving on. I said, oh, really, what, you don't like here anymore? He said, well, seen every mountain, been on every trail, uh, hunted every hunting area, fished every stream. I'm, I'm bored, right? And I was just, I mean, that always amazes me because I've never looked out here and seen the same place. Every single time I've looked here, I've been coming here all these years, I've never, it's like, where did that mountain come from? You know, it's, and it's all lights, you know, it's always changing here. The, the lights are incredible. And so this idea of like boredom, that's something I, you know, I've, that's another thing I really always amazed me about people who say I'm bored, right? How people get into that state, what happens where somebody can say I'm bored? And children are not like that. We teach them boredom. Right? Children are not bored. I mean, they're just, you know, they're, you know, in everything. Right? Which is people that take hypotropic drugs are like that, right? They start looking at leaves, like, you know, amazed at, and that's the way children are. They're in a whole other realm, right? And that type of excitement about life is not something that has to stop. Uh, discovery, in, in Arabic, the word to, to find something or discover something means to be ecstatic. And the word for existence is the same root word. Existence is the arena of ecstasy. And, and, but you have to be alive to be, in that, to, to be in that state where it is. You are in an ecstatic state because there's constant discovery. This is a theater of enlightenment. There's all these revelations happening in every moment. You know, the divine attributes are manifesting all over the place. And, and then the next is emotive dissonance. People who die emotionally. And this is the ruin of myriad marriages. Emotional death that occurs in marriages where there's no, nothing's happening. People are dead and numb inside to each other. Which, one of the things about death, and really keeping death in perspective, is unlike having the morbid uh, experience, it actually invigorates your experience of life because you, it's like, this might be the last time I'm ever with you, right? This might, I might never see you again. I mean, we leave, we go to work and come home and think that it's always going to be like this. But there's people all over this country right now that are getting phone calls. I hate to tell you this, but your husband was in a car accident today. You know, your wife, or I hate to tell you this, but you know, the test came back positive. You, you've got terminal cancer. I mean, this is going on all over right now, everywhere, right? And we forget that. You know, we go into this thing, it's always gonna be like, she'll always be around, he'll always be around. Volitional 
routinization of life. Right? Just sit down at the terminal, turn on, plug in, check my email, coffee, you know, phone rings. Yes? Okay. It's people all over the, the, the world like that. Literally just, right? Driving cars, same radio station, right? It's amazing. So that's a type of death. And then intuitive paralysis. <sighs> Losing that expansion contraction, the breath, you know, losing that, that experience of, of, right, that that breath can be cut off. And that when you're connected to your breath, you're connected to yourself in a really powerful way, which is why breath is a primary uh, meditation. Now you have, these are not universal. Um, and, and there's actually new death work um, uh, that's, that's beginning to go beyond Kubler-Ross's. I mean, she was important at one point. Um, Singh's book, uh, The Art of Dying, uh, which is published by Harper, has taken a, a whole other, and that's probably going to become an important book. Um, it's going really beyond that because there are many people that do not go through these stages. Uh, there are many people that, um, you know, but, but this is a common death denial. People in a death denial culture, this is very common, these stages, and they do work. Uh, the denial is the first stage, right? Um, he's relating them to these, but I'm not going to go into that. But denial is the first stage. You know, people hear it. Uh, there's a film called The Doctor. I don't know if people saw that, but that's very much in that genre of somebody who's told they're going to die and they thought it, it's not going to happen to me. It happens to everybody else. And this is one of... Uh, uh, you know, Ar Ar Arjuna has asked Krishna, which, what is the, the greatest wonder of the world? And he replies that the greatest wonder is that you see people dying all around you and you don't think it's going to happen to you. Right? So we, we, you know, we go into this denial of death. Um, and, and once people overcome that, it's, it's anger will often emerge. Getting angry. Why is this happening to me? Especially, you know, you're 35, 40, and you've got terminal cancer. There's a wonderful uh, piece that was written by um, Lee, was it Lee Atwater? Who was the campaign manager for Bush? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Lee Atwater. Really bad guy. This guy was bad, and he admits it. In the, it was a piece that was published in... Uh, I think New Age magazine several years back when he first, do you remember he had the brain tumor? He said that he based his life on Machiavelli's The Prince. You know, he said that that was my life, Machiavelli. This guy on top of the world could do no wrong, the Republican golden boy. But his, you know, screw unto others before they screw unto you. That was the motto of that man's life, right? Really, and he admits that in there. If he could, you know, damage, uh, attack people's reputations, do the worst things, that, that was his realm. And that's why they loved him so much, right? Because he got people elected. When he suddenly came to turn, you know, this guy's early 40s, wealthy, politically powerful, one of the major players in Washington at that time, and suddenly incurable brain tumor. That, his, that piece, you know, that should be memorized by every politician before they're allowed to run for office. Because he just talks about wanting to make amends with all the people he ever hurt. Right? And this is something amazing, uh, is that even the, the worst people can have radical transformations when confronted with their mortality. Why does it have to take that? Right? Why does it have to take that? And the you know, one of the things about our age is we're, we're confronting species death, right? We're looking at, you know, our entire world is being threatened with death, right? Our biosphere is, is, is showing signs that it can no longer sustain us because of what we're doing to it. 
And what if, if that really enters into the collective consciousness of, of, uh, of, of human societies now? What type of transformation is that? But as long as we're in denial about this, right? Or in the anger stages, like the echo warriors, right? Because they're furious, right? Earth first people. They're not in denial. They see it happening, but they're angry. You know, the Unabomber. Let's blow these people up that are ruining our world. Right? This is all anger. What? But if we, as a, as a species, could really see that we are threatened with our own extinction, that there is not going to be a sustainable world for our children, for our grandchildren, what type of transformation is going to occur? Bargaining. Give me another chance. God. I know, I mucked up, give me another chance, right? And then acceptance. This is submission. And I mentioned that, you know, the denial is kufr. That's what kufr means, rejection, right? Anger is fighting it, fighting the truth. Bargaining is trying to deal with the truth on your own terms. <laughs> right? Trying to deal with it on your own terms. I know it's true, okay, but can't we, you know, let's, let's bargain here a little bit. You know, give me a break. This is hard. I can't deal with this. And submission is, I submit. I'm accepting this thing completely. And from that experience is an incredible liberation. You transcend yourself. You are a free human being. Before that, you're a slave. You're a slave to your fears. You're a slave to your desires. Once you accept your own mortality, right, what Heidegger calls a being unto death, you can nurture. You can enter into your humanity as long as you're in denial of that most fundamental fact. And Heidegger goes to the, the radical proposition that, that, you, that your death act will be the only real thing that you will ever do that was not determined by anybody else. That every act that you do in your life is because you've been influenced by your parents, by your peers, by your education, by your society. It is death alone that will be uniquely yours. No one will teach you how to do that. No one will show you that path. You take it on your own. And so that is your one true act that can be absolutely volitional. You can die. And, and that is, is really uh, uh, in harmony with the Islamic understanding. This is kind of interesting, just in our culture, all these, these are like euphemisms, because people don't like to say he died, <laughs> right? Passed on, croaked, kicked the bucket, gone to heaven, gone home, expired, breathed his last, succumbed, left us, went to his return reward, lost, met his maker, wasted, checked out, eternal rest, laid to rest, pushing up daisies called home, was a goner, came to an end, bit the dust, annihilated, liquidated, terminated, gave up the ghost, left this world, rubbed out, snuffed, six feet under, consumed, found everlasting peace, wishful thinking, went to a new life in the great beyond, no longer with us, made the change, got myrtleized. On the other side, God took him asleep in Christ, departed, transcended, bought the farm. <laughs> With the angels, feeling no pain, lost the race. Time was up, cashed in, crossed over Jordan, Paris, lost it. Was done in, translated into glory, returned to dust, withered away in the arms, gave it up. It was curtains, a long sleep on the heavenly shores. Out of his or her misery ended it all. Angels carried him away, resting in peace, changed form, dropped the body, rode into the sunset. That was all she wrote. So a lot of ways to say the same thing. One of the Arabs said, uh, 
إن لم تموت بسيف متى بغيره تنوع تدسباب والموت واحد. If you don't die by the sword, you'll die by something else. There's a lot of ways to die, but death is one. Right.